Hello, everybody. My name is Markus Görle, and I am a system engineer at Lauterbach. I will try my best to get you guys back on track after this lunch break by giving you a short introduction about what has been going on lately regarding RISC-V debugging, uh, in particular with our development tool called Trace32. So for the one who are not familiar with our tool, I will give a very brief introduction about what we actually do. Then I will jump right into RISC-V debug and trace and what we've been working on lately and also what we've been struggling on lately uh, with the aid, first of all, of some debug scenarios. Then I will get into our support for custom ISA extensions. And finally, from our perspective, the necessity and importance for standardization of both debug and trace. So let's jump right into what we do and who we are. Lauterbach is the leading manufacturer of microprocessor development tools with a market share of over 40% in JTAG-based debuggers. Uh, we have around 120 employees worldwide, with most of them located in Munich. But we also have other branch offices in other countries as well. So our technical know-how is mainly wrapped around debug and trace. And most of that is both designed and manufactured. The hardware parts are manufactured in Munich. Uh, our run control debugging via Trace32, that's the name of our tool set, allows uh, debug and development of bare metal applications, whole operating systems. You can debug and develop driver BIOS. And you can debug pretty much any SOC right from the reset vector. So how does a conventional uh, setup look like? On the left side here, you see our user interface called PowerView. On the right side, you see a, a standard RISC-V platform. In between, you have a hardware component, for example, our power debug modules. Uh, these hardware components give you an edge concerning performance by minimizing latency. You don't have any OS dependencies. And you also can add particular, yeah, for example, off-chip trace modules or logic analyzer or anything else. So it is based on a modular basis. OK, that's pretty much it, what we generally do. So let's jump right into uh, RISC-V debug and trace with the aid of some debug scenarios. Uh, first of all, a very high-level example. We have an external debugger, Trace32, on the left, and a RISC-V chip that we want to debug. Uh, there is a generic debug port and some interconnect, and also the standard RISC-V debug IP. Hopefully, by now, all of you are familiar that uh, the RISC-V Foundation, or the debug work group in particular, is designing, uh, currently designing a standard for RISC-V debugging. And so let's look into how this looks in the context of integrating this into a RISC-V system. Um, first of all, um, there is a component called debug transport module for the debug specification. Uh, this is sort of the interface between the actual RISC-V debug IP and anything that lies beyond that. In the most simple case, it would be just an external debug port, for example, uh, JTAG pins. Uh, this is not illustrated in this example because it's quite straightforward and simple. Uh, what is more interesting and what is also depicted in this example is if you try to integrate a RISC-V debug IP into an existing more complex chip. For example, if you want to try to integrate it uh, in a chip with uh, already existing debug IP. For example, you have a debugger that is connected via external pins of via JTAG, serial wire debug, and we also support solutions that use USB as a dedicated interface for debug or even trace solutions. Uh, then there can be, for example, a system bus or some other means of interconnect. For, uh, for example, there could be an ARM core side system. And here is where it gets interesting, because um, a lot of people are already, of course, implementing this RISC-V debug IP. And they tend to usually just use what is standard. So they go ahead and just put the JTAG debug transport module right into this chip, possibly interconnecting to an ARM core side system. Uh, well, that does work, but it's not really performant and not very, yeah. So there are better ways to do that. So we're working close with, uh, with system developers to work around that, to find new solutions. For example, one simple approach would be to neglect the debug transport module or find a different approach by uh, simply di directly mapping the debug registers on an existing system bus, if available. So let's now jump back from the um, yeah, interconnection and go more into the RISC-V core and their context. Um, here in this example, we have three RISC-V cores. 
uh, there is a Linux operating system mapped to two identical RISC-V cores on the left, and then there's a second operating system mapped to a third RISC-V core. So obviously, if you want to debug this, you need multi-core debugging. More particular, you may want to debug the two uh, cores running Linux in a synchronous multiprocessing session. That means you want to have a synchronous reset, synchronous halt, whoops, sorry, uh, synchronous on-chip triggers, etc. So uh, the debug specification has certain means of synchronizing this, but it also gets more complex if, for example, you have more than one debug module. Uh, of course, you also want to debug the third risk 5 core in an asynchronous manner. So long story short, uh, we're uh, working hard to make risk 5 multi-core debugging as stable as possible in a lot of Orions. Uh, another thing that this example shows or should be aware of is Linux debugging. As you know, the Linux kernel 4.15 brings support for risk 5 And so our trace32 Linux awareness comes into game here. So what's so special about this, and why is this necessary? Well, uh, debugging a complex operating system such as Linux demands a little bit more from a debugger than just a general debugging tasks that you're usually used to. Uh, without going into particular extrusional details, for example, you need, or the debugger needs to be generally aware of the operating system that it is debugging and providing the information to the user. So you want to debug the Linux processes, threads, and be aware of dynamic objects such as libraries and kernel modules, and you want to view certain lists of tasks and kernel modules and also keep track of addresses of dynamic objects. So this is what we are bringing with Trace Linux Awareness for RISC-V. OK, now let's jump back to our example and extend it a little bit. Um, Usually, when you have a complex SOC that you want to debug, the SOC is not only composed of RISC-V cores, even if it's different RISC-V cores at hand, like in this example, but also other architectures as well. So our development tools have a wide set of architectures that are supported. Here, in this case, I just have general place orders for two other core architectures. So no matter if it's an ARM core or an Intel core or any other arbitrary architecture, we make sure that our Linux driver works in a heterogeneous system and co can debug all different architectures in one single debug session simultaneously. OK, now about the support for custom ISA extensions. As you probably already heard from the previous presentations, there's two categories. One is the default extensions for the RISC-V ISA, like multiprocessing, atomic, compressed. But the ISA also defines uh, possibilities to extend your ISA with certain own custom tailored and designed extensions. So we try to uh, provide possibilities to integrate and support that as well. So first of all, if somebody asks us, can you support custom RISC-V extensions, you should be aware of what they're actually asking and what this actually means and affects. Uh, well, most obvious thing is, and most straightforward, disassembler and assembler need, of course, be available for uh, displaying the additional mnemonics. But it also affects, for example, stepping and trace, no matter if high-level stepping or assembler stepping. Uh, in particular, if you have instructions that alter the program flow. Also, the instruction set simulator needs to, um, to simulate the new um, instruction behavior. So how can we support this? There's one obvious way and one less obvious way. The most obvious way, of course, is direct integration to our tools. So that means we simply hard code the extension or the information we need into a, directly into our software. This pretty much affects all the parts, like disassembler, stepping, trace, etc., that you want and that you need. So you just need to be aware of what actually is affected and what you actually need from our tool, and then we can add support to it. Pretty straightforward, not much to add here. But there's also a way that is uh, less obvious, and that is integration. Uh, you can pretty much integrate it yourself. We provide an API for that. It's called API for Auxiliary Serving Processing Units. And you pretty much just have to write a small, simple runtime library and learn, uh, load, for example, an external disassembler plugin with this. So this pretty much allows to add support for disassembler, assembler yourself. So maybe you're asking yourself now, why should I do the work when Lauterbach can do it for me? Why should I choose the second option when the first option seems more convenient? Well, 
in many cases, the first uh, option that I just showed previously uh, might fit your needs, but there's also reasons to go this uh, road. And for example, one reason is if you have ISA extensions that are confidential, they're secret, and you don't want to reveal them to third parties, such as Lauterbach. So in this case, you can write your own plugin and be safe. Or another um, scenario could be if you're in early prototyping phase of your system and both your, you know, your modules, your ISA, are changing rapidly on a daily basis and you want to be very flexible and adapt your debug system as fast as possible, then this might also be a suitable approach for you, even if it's only as an interim solution. OK, that would be pretty much it about custom ISA extensions. Uh, the last thing that I want to talk about is standardization. Um, as I already told previously, uh, there is a, um, um, a standard debug specification in the development, and we're experiencing that a lot of customers, a lot of uh, system developers that we're in close contact with are already using that IP. They're implementing it also for soon-to-be commercial products and pretty much dealing with it as if it were a final specification. Of course, it's not the case. It's still a draft, but still. Um, there's hopefully not going to be that many changes, so they're already going with it, which is fine. We have a stable debug driver for it. Everything is good. However, we also, when we look at other customers, there's a variety of users who still go with a different approach, and they develop their own custom debug IP. So needless to say, this is not really desirable for many reasons. First of all, the most obvious one, as you see here, we need to uh, develop a debug driver for every single one of these implementations, which costs time, effort, and of course, needs some time to get a stable and good system running. Uh, second of all, of course, if you implement your own custom debug IP, and there are so many out there, uh, this uh, leads to fragmentation of the debug system. Of course, uh, the standard debug IP is still a draft, but this doesn't unfortunately change the fact that a lot of companies are already using this draft and also uh, building chips that are uh, ready to sail. So we currently have a lot of custom uh, solutions in the making, and once these custom solutions are finished, we are also willing to support these solutions. So this fragmentation, once it's done, is not very likely to change in the near future because, of course, a customer says, OK, even if a draft becomes a final specification later on, why would I change my running system afterwards if I already have something? That means additional development effort. OK, so by the way, the same also applies for Trace. There, the situation is slightly different because there is no uh, specification even in the making. There is no Trace workgroup, at least as far as I am aware of. So um, here, of course, also people go with uh, custom solutions, which we are also willing to support and also already um, looking at. OK, so in summary, this means uh, we have a lot of, yeah, we need a lot of time to support these solutions. And the fragmentation is, of course, something that stands in the way of getting a uniform, a stable, and well-established debugging system. So I would just like the opportunity to um, encourage people to um, yeah, contribute to the debug specification, get your inputs, no matter if it's uh, positive feedback or negative, and yeah, work on a strong RISC-V ecosystem. OK. That is it from my side. Thank you for your attention.